had a good lunch. We're going to look very firmly at evidence-based policing at this stage, and there's a good reason for that, because with the success of the evidence-based police model at Cambridge, which you know quite well and which does not need definition to you, there's an awful lot of universities and other practitioners out there suddenly saying, oh, what we're doing is evidence-based policing. I've been through a lot of websites, and I can't find what most of them claim is evidence-based policing. But I do know what it is here, and I do know how it works here. And Rachel Tuffin, who's our guest this afternoon, who's the director... Afternoon! Director of, <laughs> director of Knowledge, Research and Education at the College of Policing. There's a mouthful for anybody it's to live up to. a terrible job title. <laughs> but it seems to have got so far successfully in it because she's got an OBE for services to evidence-based policing and there's not many people can mm -hmm. say that. I have known Rachel for a long time. I have great confidence in her ability and her wisdom and I commend her to you as worth listening to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. It's very kind of you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've quite, I think I've done this gig most years um, just to talk about what we're trying to do to provide the support in the UK for evidence-based policing. Give me a wave if you've heard me bore on about evidence-based policing before. Yes, lots of you. <laughs> um, so now you're going to get another dose. <laughs> um, but I'll try and make it a little bit different. Um, and always what's great actually about this event in particular is it's a sort of opportunity to take stock of where we've got to um, for me and, and I suppose for you too. Um, it's always really exciting because we get all the new findings from the pracademics. I don't, I don't really like the term, but anyway, from the police officers and staff who are out there doing the research. We get to hear about that and that's kind of always really inspiring because it's at the heart of what the college model really is. It's about police officers and staff actually doing this stuff and using it themselves. So that's at the heart of what we care about. But there's an awful lot to do, as all of you in your own organisations will know, to try and have this land out there, for this to be part of a system, for it not to be something that just sort of lives in your heads or in your little part of a business much more the sort of thing that we saw with Mike Barton right at the beginning of the day, where it's part of a system. And there you've got a leader who, working with us, but actually a lot of just what's being done in Durham on their own to make that happen. So how can we help make it part of a national system? How can we make it part of a bigger picture? That's going to, the kind of the developments in that is what I'm going to talk about. So um, the first thing I wanted to just do was to say, who's seen that? Give me a wave if you've, you've seen that before. Um, any of you that haven't, so that's, that's the sort of the, the bedrock, the starting point for us in terms of what we've done to try and establish what do we know in terms of um, evidence-based policing. And it just draws on all the reviews of the evidence done to a certain standard, so all the reviews of the research that have been done that actually have to meet a certain threshold because this is a what works toolkit. So these are what works questions, so they use trials basically trials and some um, quasi-experimental methods. So all of the reviews of the evidence that you see here are using that kind of evidence. We do use other kinds of evidence as well for other kinds of questions, but when it comes to what works, this is our sort of bedrock. And that's the, what we know so far. That's what the evidence is telling us so far. If you put Crime Reduction Toolkit into Google, I think, of course, it, you, you never know, quite know what other people get when they put crime reduction toolkit into Google. It might not be the same as what I get, but you should get that, I think. Um, not kind of pictures of kittens or something else completely random. Um, and in, in what, what's been fascinating about this is just how long it takes for it to kind of sink into consciousness and into decision making and for people to, to know this is the best we've got so far. Also, as some of you will know, quite how hard it is to kill some of the interventions for which there is no evidence or where the intervention is, so far, the evidence is that it's actually harmful. Um, my favourite zombie intervention being, of course, scared straight, which never dies. And uh, I'm always getting contacts and uh, colleagues tell me about contacts they get saying, we've had this great idea, we're going to take children into prisons. So, oh, God. <laughs> yes, anyway. Um, so that's the kind of, that's our basis we want more things to go into this. And I'm going to say something right at the end about how you and the people that you work with can help us get more studies into reviews to get into here so that we can then use it, as I will tomorrow. I'm going to go and talk to the Justice Committee about the prison population. I'm not the best qualified person to do it, but I was all they could find. Um, alongside two other people, um, we're going to be talking about what's the evidence base actually on crime reduction. 
in terms of how does that relate to the prison population. And this is the sort of thing that we use for that. So this, we, we try and get these messages across in all of those kinds of, of forums. So we need more. We need to build that evidence base all the time. So that's the... But we find as well that people find this a little bit hard to engage with. So we've got a new version. Levin Weller, are you in the room? Yes, there he is over there. Um, Levin Weller's been working um, with colleagues on this to try and develop a new way of putting the evidence together, something a bit more intuitive that people can play with. So we're just about to launch it. You can see it's got you know, different colours for diversion and, and offending and so forth. So you've got different ways of engaging with the evidence. You can pin things. You can look at it differently. And when we tried this out on police and crime commissioners at an event recently, so the previous version, it, it's OK, but it's, you know, they, they didn't engage with it as easily as when we gave them this on the laptops. They liked this much better. Um, it's easier to, to engage with. So we're always trying to think of different ways of packaging it up as well to get that first interaction. Because you will all know there's lots of complexity behind this first bit of evidence, but you need to get people's attention first. It's my kind of um, rule of thumb. So get attention first and then pull them into the complexity. And this sort of thing um, seems to be really helping us to do that. So we're working on those kinds of things. And then the next bit, and this is a really important systems bit for us in the UK, um, is about putting the evidence into standards. So we've just launched the Neighbourhood Policing Guidelines for consultation. So that was review of the evidence and then a committee with specialist officers generalists and staff, um, academics and college staff, all sitting together, looking at the evidence and saying, what recommendations should we make based on this evidence? What should we be telling other officers and staff to do on the basis of this evidence? Do we think the evidence is strong enough to make any recommendations? So we've got neighbourhood policing one, we've got two more coming, one on initial accounts um, and one on de-escalation. And this is going to be the way we work in the future. So always evidence-based, starting with what does the evidence tell us, and then moving on to working with a team of practitioners to argue and debate, OK, what should we do with this evidence then? What is this telling us? And also using calls for practice. So sending out to say to people, what new and emerging stuff are you doing? What can you tell us about this area of practice? Is there anything that we should be putting in as case study examples. So that's, again, a big part of trying to make this part of a system so that it's wrapping around people. You've got the, the knowledge for decision-making. You've got evidence embedded in the standards, um, sometimes invisible, sometimes very visible. And we've tried to make it clear. You can see at the bottom, we want people to know what the evidence base is. So they, they can look at it and decide for themselves whether... Um, or not they want to argue with it. I mean, a lot of the evidence base in, in, in this area, in, in neighbourhood policing, is actually reasonably good. Um, you will know there are lots of other areas where it isn't very good, but there are a lot of things here that we can say about what to do with analysis, what to do um, with problem solving. A lot of the work that you've been doing and been talking about um, over the past couple of days actually gives us evidence to inform, inform this. So getting it into the standards has been... I mean, I say all that really glibly, like it's easy. It's nearly killed some of the people who've had to actually do this um, and in the timetables that we've been asking them to do. Because, of course, we're always trying um, to meet the timetable of our sector. We, we, we can't have things that take two years to do. So we, we try and do these things much faster than they would do them in other sectors, um, and particularly in health. So we try not to cut corners, but, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all good fun. And then we also try and put an evidence-based approach in all the national programmes. The most recent one of these is on wellbeing. So um, big amount of money given on behalf of the service to the college to do some national testing of initiatives that could be part of a national wellbeing programme in the future. So to do that, we're saying... We, there, was a, there was a push at the beginning to say, let's just do X, because X seems to work. And we had quite a lot of argument and debate with, with people saying, we don't think that's the right approach. We would like to taste, take some things that we think work. There's evidence in other sectors that look like they might be the right things to do, but actually test them in policing and then use that to help us design the national service. 
all, you, you will all know, any of you who've ever tried to do anything like this and had those kind of wrangles, um, it can make you quite unpopular and it can slightly slow things down. I mean, not necessarily for a long time, but that's the sort of thing that we're always trying to do is trying to get the evidence in there, get a testing approach in there from the outset and keep it kind of visible um, wherever we can. It's an evidence-based approach. That's just what we do. It's just normal. Um, so that's the, the well-being stuff. More widely, um, and this we've got a, a, another meeting actually in the afternoon tomorrow talking about this with the Economic and Social Research Council. We're trying to join up with our fellow What Work centres and with other government departments. Because going back to the Crime Reduction Toolkit, you can see most of the interventions there, um, well, there are a few. So you've got, you've got some that are suitable for the police to do on their own, but an awful lot of them are in interventions that involve other people in other sectors health, education, local government. And so the police can't, obviously, do that on their own. And the problem we think, well, it's, it's kind of an obvious thing. What happens, of course, is if we talk about crime reduction or criminal justice and say we need to do something about crime reduction, our partners are not really that interested because that's not what they need to focus on. Um, there's a bit of a difference, a bit of an emerging um, theme in public health where they are a bit more interested in talking about violence in particular as a public health issue. But often, other sectors, it's kind of, well, crime reduction's your problem. Um, so what we've been working on is finding ways to bring people together around themes or populations, so young people at risk, um, or other kind of ideas, like uh, troubled families is a good example of it, but bringing them together to try and get the evidence base that works for all of us. So outcomes that we can share across the sectors. And it's really obvious in the case of young people's interventions, you'll see. So there are some social skills interventions which have got a pretty decent evidence base um, for teenage pregnancy, drug and alcohol misuse, um, risky behaviours in terms of crime. They don't have much of an evidence base yet in attainment, which is coming, but not quite there yet. So education are much less interested in them. The problem is, where do you want to go and do those interventions? Where is it cheap to do them? In schools. Oh, dear. So you need to try and bring people together to share the evidence base, share the development of the evidence base, do the testing together and review the evidence together. <laughs> it's, it's easy, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's only taken us uh, about a year to get to the point of having this meeting with all of these different government departments um, to actually see whether we can persuade people to put some money, we will put some in, um, to, to form a sort of evidence hub in this way. So that's some of the other things. That's right at the outer edges of it's not really, strictly speaking, our crime reduction central focus, but it's important enough, we think, that we have to try and bring other people together to work on, on some of those cross-cutting areas. Otherwise, we're all looking at things individually, or none of us are looking at particular populations of, of very at-risk um, individuals. So that's another um, sort of ongoing area where we're trying to build up a sort of system um, approach. And then this, this is, is interesting, but this is similar to some of the, stuff, the work that Winnie was talking about last night, if you were here for that lecture. This is how we try and bury evidence-basedness in every single part of what is um, the professional development of police officers and police staff. So the things you can see on the screen there, on the left is the, the values and competency framework. So it's got critical thinking in it, it's got um, analytical, it's got, it's, it's got those kinds of things in it which mean you would be more likely than not to be um, able to cope with an evidence-based approach. Um, that goes back to, so I was asking why we didn't do um, very much on testing um, for sort of evidence-based approaches on the, the assessment centre that you have to do to be a chief police officer. And they said to me, well, because it's not in the competency framework. So I said, right then, we'll have to change the competency framework. So that's the, the new competency framework in the national policing curriculum. So we have a national curriculum um, for most um, police uh, training and development if it's, if it's got any kind of sort of core central need and it's in there. So we try and review everything so that we know what the evidence base is or isn't. There's still lots more work to do there to make sure that either it's got the latest evidence in it 
or it's supporting people to be evidence-based. And then you've got the education qualification framework, which I think somebody said yesterday, it's not at all contentious. We don't have any activity on Twitter to do with um, uh, degree level um, training for police officers at all, not a problem. Um, and then continuing professional development down the bottom. And I am gonna say just a little bit more about the, about the education levels point, because I think it's, it's causing a lot of um, uh, consternation. And I just, I, I mean, in, in this audience, I think you will all get it, but I think it's worth just pausing on why we think it's so important to move to an education programme for officers which gives them a different level of development. And it, it relates a little bit to what colleagues were saying earlier about discretion and about professional judgment. You cannot write down or train officers in every single thing that HMIC and whoever else, Home Office, IOPC, coroners, want to train them in. It is not possible to do that. Right? But we've created this system where people think it is possible and they can just keep spooning new things in. I know, well, let's train them now on any one of those things and some more things. Actually, what we need is a much better structural system which gives them a really strong grounding on the sorts of skills that allow them to take the decisions in their own right, that prepare them for that kind of decision making. It's not that they can't do it, they do it all the time already, but we don't prepare them for it. We don't give them the support and the professional de de development that they deserve. And if you look at the difference in the two levels, you'll really see it. When, so when I first found that, it was so stark. I thought, right, OK, now I get it. Because I wasn't entirely convinced myself at first. So if you look at the level three, so the kind of development that you, you would get for level three, which is what we were giving them, it prepares them to follow instructions. Prepares police officers to follow instructions, follow orders, do what they're told. Is that what police officers ever do from the moment they go out? Mm, no. <laughs> if you look at the box on the right, so applying transferable skills, making decisions in complex environments, they are doing all this stuff all the time, every day. Do we prepare them for it? No. So for me, that's what this is all about. It's giving them the preparation that they actually deserve and filling some of the gaps in the curriculum that were there on vulnerability, um, digital crime. I mean, all the things that you would expect, all the new modern demand stuff, none of it was in the curriculum and we just haven't been giving them that preparation. So that's the reason why insufficient investment over quite a long period of time in what we really should be doing to develop police officers. But anyway, I'm sure for a lot of you that's quite... Yeah, kind of makes sense. Um, but again, it's something that's, that's misleading people, I think, because they think it's something that's going to act as a barrier, and really it's more about helping people um, to, to handle um, and deal with the, the, the degree of complexity. <laughs> and the other part of that, so uh, this, the, 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 we've created guidance on officers need training, and everybody wants something specific to their bit of the, the business. So, my water-based rescue, which is really mean, but it is my favourite one. Um, so, we run something called um, the, the Solutions Panel to help with this. Every single bit of specialism in policing, HMIC, Home Office, everybody, will, will always come to us saying, we need guidance, there's a problem. We need guidance on, we need training on, you know, officers need training in. Um, and this example, they came saying, we've got this, we've written the guidance already. It's, it's fine, you don't need to do anything. We've written guidance on water-based rescue, we just need officers to, to follow the guidance. So where, can you publish it for us? I say, okay. So um, who's it for? What kind of officers? All officers, okay. All frontline officers will, will need this guidance. Um, how long is it? 32 pages. Um, and it wasn't even laminated. Ba-boom! So if you're in a water-based rescue situation, it's going to be a little bit... Yeah, sorry. Um, so it's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, we, we had quite a debate with, with the people who brought it to the solutions panel, discussed it, probed, thought about it. The problem is, what happens is, people do a massive job, they, they do all of the kind of reading and the researching into the law and all the issues, and they get it into a nice big 32-page document. But what they don't do is the next bit, which is to think about, OK, I've done that now, what is the only bit of this that a frontline officer might need or might actually need to have memorised? Because there might be something, there might be just one thing. Because that's the bit that you then need to think about and think about how we could get the people out there, so people like you, 
to take those examples and then test them. So we've been running a little bursary, some, some Cambridge folk have got the bursary, um, to try and encourage people to do more in evidence-based policing. I would love it if instead of getting this officers need training in, officers need guidance on, people take one of those problems and think, what could I test to solve that problem? That would be a terrific shift and we're starting to see it. You can see some of the examples that come out here and in other contexts too. So. Last thing, um, we're trying to create a system and there's been a sort of national recognition. Have you seen, give us a wave if you've seen the, that's the UK policing vision for 2025. So I wouldn't expect anybody outside the UK to have uh, read it. Uh, but yeah, there's quite a few people who've seen it. So basically that's kind of our chief police officers and um, their um, political colleagues joined together to create a vision for 2025. It's, it's you know, it's, it's got all of the core things that you would want to see in there, but it's how do we actually get to that point that we're now wrestling with. And one of the big gaps that people have identified is about knowledge sharing and speedy knowledge sharing in particular. And there's something there that I think you as a group of individuals um, and people that you know could really help with, which is when you have an idea and you're starting to test something, so um, some of the ones that have been presented today in Kent, um, in um, uh, Sussex, if you're going to do that, what, we will, what we're going to put in place is a sort of per, it's a person-to-person -person ne network, a face-to-face -face network, because we've realised that there's, there are limits to what we can do with um, the digital world. Um, to get people to share with us when they are thinking of testing something. And we will take that and try and find other places in the country that might be willing to do the test as well, to speed up kind of um, replication, concurrent replication. When I was talking to Barack about it earlier, gave me a nice term for it. Um, so that we can actually start to find more quickly results which we can feed up into the toolkit. So one of the things we'll be doing is to create an innovation network. If you're interested in being part of that, um, then you can email me and I will pass that on to Neris, who's leading on this area of work. My, my um, email address is, as you would expect, for anybody who's kind of seen college emails, it's rachel.tuffin, my first name, dot my surname, at college, or come and have a quick word. So that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're most interested in, in terms of the, the knowledge sharing. There are some other things which I think less interesting for this audience so I'm not going to talk too much about those and then just one more thing that I wanted to mention so and that's the high risk pilots register um, somebody mentioned earlier on about HMIC telling a force to stop doing something um, because um, it wasn't in line with what they thought should be the standard it was the telephone investigation um, of domestic abuse now, that also happened to Hampshire um, and what we and they came to us to talk about it and said Actually, we think we're probably getting better results using telephone investigation of these lower risk, non-intimate partner um, uh, incidents. So we talked to them about it. We talked to them about the evaluation they were doing. Um, we peer reviewed it. And what we've used that for is to create this concept of having a high risk register. So we will provide, if you like, some kind of cover for people. They can bring their concept to us, their test that they want to do. We will peer review the evaluation design and then we will be prepared to say, which is what we did with HMIC, and HMIC were then prepared to let the evaluation go ahead to say, the college thinks this is appropriate, this is an evaluation that has a decent design, it should be allowed to go ahead, it is right that this test, this should be tested. So that's the latest thing that we're going to do um, and we're about to launch that. So if you've got things that you want to put on that register, I'm really interested to see what kind of volume of interest there is. And also, um, Levin is the person who's going to be responsible for it. Give us another wave, Levin. There he is. Um, so if you've got something for the pilot's register, then talk to Levin um, and we're going to build that up over the next year and see where we get to for next year. So that is us, essentially, what we're trying to do to help support the system. And as I said, innovation, pilots, registers, do get in touch. Thanks very much for listening. Cheers.